the reading and the social politics mm -hmm. of the educational piece. His doctoral thesis on citizens' income was published as Freedom and Security in 1999, and since then he's written numerous books and articles in the field of social policy and political economy, and particularly on citizens' income and on the environment as a policy issue. He has been principal editor of the International Encyclopedia of Social Policy. Later this month, Edward Elder will publish his International Handbook on Social Policy and the Environment. And in September, the Policy Press will publish his Climate Change. Tony will be speaking to us on citizens' income, essential in multiple contexts. Thank you, Tony. Um, well, no, not quite. I changed the title of the story. If you look at the history of ideas and try to write it down on a piece of paper, it would be very dense with scribbles and doodles and so on and so forth. And some of those scribbles would form patterns and some of those patterns would overlap. But basically up to 25 centuries, you would have lots of what appears to be sort of chaos <coughs> and noise. So when we consider the future of society, the nature of a good society, it's not exactly it is. paper which got the current state of economic and social policy and now I think we'd be, we'd be faced with more of a blank silence. Um, if you look at it closely you would see that there are certain lines there. Um, the lines that were established 70 years ago by the architects of the welfare state would be there even though some of them would now be rubbed out and for all of its faults I think that the welfare state is the closest that we've yet come to a combination of freedom and social justice. And despite the last 40 years of assaults upon it, many of its foundations are still standing. And then also on that piece of paper, of course, there would be free market liberalism. Uh, still there, uh, six years after the worst um, global crisis since the Great Depression, the Great Depression, of course, was also uh, caused by the rampantness of free market liberalism. And as in the 1930s, there has been, since that crisis, a certain resurgence of populist, nationalist, authoritarian, although thankfully without the kind of militarism uh, which characterized the 1930s. So, so far as progressive ideas go, that policy paper seems to be fairly vacant. So how do we take the scribbles which are on the other paper, the history of ideas, and apply them to the policy paper? How do we build upon the legacy of the welfare state and counter the power of economic liberalism? What is the good society and how do we go about creating it? And does basic income have a role to play? Now in my 1999 book, Freedom and Security, I talked about the idea in the context of certain political ideas. What I want to give you today um, is to put the uh, proposal in the context of, of four sort of moral philosophies. So beginning with what I think is the most accurate description of existing society, one which is very heavily based around the practices and the values of employment. And to some extent, of course, that's because of history and religion, the Protestant work ethic and so forth. Uh, the notion that wage earning has inherent virtue and value has been preached by Christian and capitalists alike. But not only by that, because you know, to some extent the work ethic historically had a genuine emancipatory, emancipatory potential, compared certainly to the feudal bonds of an earlier society. So the dignity of labor was the means by which the labor movement advanced its end. And for many on the left, the problem with capitalism is, because it, is that it didn't fully embody the work ethic. It wasted talents, it wasted people's potential. And for others, it was more of a practical matter. Um, by the late 1940s, there were some on the left who were warning that the horizons of redistribution had already <coughs> been reached. Production, the bridge to socialism, was the title of the 1948 Labour Party pamphlet. So critics of basic income therefore observe um, that it contradicts what they see as the productivist society, strong correlation between earnings and income, contribution and reward. The unconditional nature of a basic kingdom is probably the most widely cited objection to it. But a productivist argument for basic kingdom points out that it could help labor markets to work more flexibly by smoothing the transition between non-employment and employment, by making low-wage jobs more financially attractive, albeit with the 
of a regulatory framework of a minimum wage, etc., and by giving greater income security to those currently suffering from insecurities in a labor market where flexibility currently works very much in favor of the corporation and the employer. So could unconditionality, therefore, be presented to people as a price worth paying? The more directly moral argument for basic income is, is that it would actually take us beyond the productivist <coughs> framework. The technical term here is decommodification, the notion that freedom from dependency on markets, freedom from economic necessity, freedom from wage slavery and economic power is itself a desirable aim. And though it was always limited in this context, um, the fact that the welfare state achieved the degree of decommodification partly explains why the free market rights are so in intent on prioritizing it down to the bone. So what's wrong with productivism? Why might we want to move beyond it? Well, it gives excessive economic and political power to those who own key resources. It potentially squeezes out other forms of value of social participation, such as terror work or the value that we find uh, within the natural environment. And there's also the value of time. Productivism involves a time squeeze, um, which is something that we all, I think, experience, which is particularly debilitating for the least advantaged. Now, it could be argued by some that growth is necessary if we are to afford distributive and social justice. The problem um, over the last four decades is that social equality has become less visible within government reforms and growth, uh, materialism, possessive individualism, individualism, etc., have become their own ends. So that takes me to uh, my second sort of moral sector, which has been alluded to already this morning. And this is kind of the case for egalitarian justice. Now, of course, there are many arguments that pertain here. Uh, but I want to stick within the framework of, of moral philosophy, if that's okay. And, and this is an opportunity for you to feel sorry for my students, uh, <laughs> from whom this is being taken. So within moral philosophy, there are really sort of two um, justifications for social justice in recent um, decades. Firstly, consequentialism, which says that something is justified if its effects are beneficial, if it increases happiness or satisfies preferences. And whether or not the work ethic um, is socially or personally beneficial, it doesn't for consequentialists possess any intrinsic value. So if the benefits of greater equality outweigh the disadvantages, then according to the consequentialists, we should redistribute up to the point where those advantages and disadvantages begin to balance one another out. And the recent emphasis, including in public debates with interest in happiness, is largely a consequentialist influence, a utilitarian influence. So over the last 10 years, we've been inundated with research which suggests that more growth doesn't necessarily equate to more well-being. Now, for a consequentialist, basic income would have detrimental effects if enough people believe it would have detrimental effects. If they're not sold on the idea of unconditionality, of something for nothing, then ipso facto basic income would be seen as harmful. And for that, for the consequentialist would be the knockdown argument. But observing that basic income has its weaknesses isn't necessarily the end of the argument. Even if people continue to dislike the principle of unconditionality, they might be prepared to live with it if you could demonstrate to them uh, that basic income's benefits would outweigh its disadvantages. The second sort of moral philosophy is uh, Kantianism, and again, we've actually already heard reference to this today, and this is the notion that agents, persons, do have inherent, intrinsic moral worth. So this is very much the language of sovereign uh, rights. Does the work ethic reflect the decisions of free beings? Capitalist markets certainly appeal to choice, to the notion of the consumer as king or queen, or does the ethic actually represent um, something which undermines autonomy? Now, when Kant referred to what he called the kingdom of ends, what I think he was trying to do was to stress the interdependency that work, even within a liberal society. And it might well be that an unconditional kingdom would undermine that sense of connection. So a latter-day Kantian like John Rawls uh, certainly believed in the uh, a, a, 
arranging things to the benefit of the least well off. Uh, but in the rulesing kind of framework, that shouldn't involve making room for, in the usual term, free riders. On the other hand, if it can be demonstrated that it is wage earning, uh, the productivist ethic which undermines autonomy, then the case basic income improves. There are many types of free riding, for instance, and perhaps a guaranteed freedom from employment uh, and the compulsions of employment is a necessary condition for people entering into contracts and relationships with others. Unless people have a, have a secure floor, then they won't be able to stand comfortably and sustainably. Now, in recent years, the uh, traditional sort of framework of the moral philosophy um, has been added to by a revival of Aristotelianism. And for Aristotelians, importance resides not just in what we do, but in the character of the person doing it. So what should I do is a question intimately related to the question, who am I? Your inquiry after my health means a lot more to me if you are the kind of person who is genuinely concerned than if you're just, say, a consequentialist who's trying to produce uh, good effects. So, from an Aristotelian perspective, justice implies the possession of virtue, uh, the pursuit of excellence, and that pursuits through um, the community, through participation in your community's way of life. So, being and doing are intimately related. True happiness therefore, what um, the ancient Greeks called eudaimonia means self-fulfillment. It means the realization of the virtues, the realization of the potential already residing within you. The more we act morally, the more we appreciate what morality means, and the more likely we are to practice virtue. So moral conduct itself generates a capacity for moral conduct. Citizenship is about good character. Good cities require good characters, and good characters require good cities. Each is a condition for the other. And this Aristotelian notion has come back into fashion because of the work of people like Michael Sandel and Skidelskis and the books that they published uh, a couple of years ago. Now, in terms of basic income, if an unconditional income allows people to avoid the practices of a virtuous society, to drop out, to write bad poetry, to become a purely private person, then from an Aristotelian point of view, that would be regrettable, uh, that would be objectionable, because the Aristotelian says that we should all be involved in trying to create the common good for each other. Acting with and for others is the means by which we achieve excellence, and perhaps a basic income would take us away from that goal. However, from an Aristotelian perspective, Robert and Edward Skidelsky have defended the principle of unconditionality. The actual scheme, they say, could be designed to minimize the risk of money being wasted. People could be educated for leisure. People could be educated to appreciate the kinds of values of activities that reside in the unpaid, in things which are done for free. So overall, the basic income, they seem to say, would take the emphasis away from the cash nexus. Paradoxically, there would be money that would help to break the grip of our money-obsessed society. And finally, my final sort of moral context is um, what I call the regenerative. And this is to make, there are many things that could go under this heading, but I'm going to make reference here to uh, Epicurean ethics. Uh, there haven't been many Epicurean philosophers in the last 2,000 years. Um, there was Thomas Jefferson, uh, and now there's me. <laughs> in the ancient world, Epicureanism was perhaps the greatest challenge to Aristotelian ethics, so it would be interesting to see whether the revival of Aristotelian ethics will then generate a revival in uh, Epicurean ethics. And one of the problems with Aristotle is that he tended to subordinate parts to whole, or in a less rarefied language, he tended to subordinate the needs, the interests of individuals to that of the community, the common good. And this notion of subordinating yourself to the community is, you know, from a kind of liberal perspective, something that would be deeply regrettable. And it's no uh, coincidence that Aristotle has often appealed to religious and moral and political conservatives. So the Epicurean argues that we shouldn't interpret everything we do or might do in terms of its contribution to the polis or the telos. In the context of our productivist society, this might mean making connections with the idea of doubt.
downtiming, of relaxing, of taking it easy, of finding other things to do away from the pressures and the expectations uh, of, of the economy. Doing these things for its own sake. So while Epicureans share the notion that happiness is about fulfillment in activities and ways of life with others, they don't discount the importance of simple pleasures either. And more than that, if you read Lucretius' poem, uh, De Rerum Natura, um, it's filled with reminders of mortality, of decay, of the fact that we aren't here for very long. And given that all of us only have limited time, then it isn't a morality of enjoyment, of value, of doing things for their own sake, rather than <laughs> producing and extracting uh, and exploiting something that we ought to promote. And associations can be made here with the slow movement, uh, slow films, um, slow food, slow reading, and in my case, slow that. Hmm. And on a more political level, there are connections here with environmental ethics. The Epicurean, Epicurean saw intrinsic value in all parts of nature, whereas Aristotle's tendency was to split nature into distinct levels of value. And our productivist societies are very much in denial uh, about their dependency, our dependency, upon natural resources. So the overuse of resources and the misuse of natural resources go together. So reductions in use and in the fair distribution of what we have means finding new sources of value and having the time to do so. So Epicurean politics is very much a temporal politics, which calls for freedom from economic necessity, more discretionary time, and reduction in an unequal distribution of time. And basic income acceptability or not within this framework depends upon whether it can contribute to that kind of a regenerative politics of time. Now, there are many different ways. Um, I counted at least 13, in fact, in which we could take uh, those sort of four <coughs> schools and put them together. Um, productivist socialists uh, will insist that GDP growth is needed if justice is, is to be realized, uh, and a regenerative politics could in some way uh, help the causes of economic efficiency and productivity. Um, but there are many different ways, I wouldn't even try to summarize them here, in which you can actually sort of interlink and interrelate these four sectors. But our societies and our economies are currently dominated by productivist schemes and practices and principles. The more party politics has sort of clustered itself around the campfires of, of corporate capitalism, the more even modest suggestions of social change um, appear dark and frightening. The storytellers of economic liberalism have managed to scare us. They insist that taking even modest steps into the surrounding landscape risks disaster, and because we believe them, we continue to huddle around the campfire. Massive social inequalities, they say, are just a price to be paid for remaining warm and secure. So our aim, I put it to you, should be to find a new post-productivist settlement, one that could certainly include uh, the productive, but which would no longer be dominated by it. And the case for a basic income rests on whether and the extent to which it could make that happen. So that's why, going back to my new title, uh, the combination of scheming and dreaming continues to be important. Uh, the schemers shouldn't mind the dreamers dreaming, and the dreamers shouldn't care if the schemers are scheming. Politically, philosophically, and what I'm proposing today morally, the basic income debate has always and has to continue to occur within a fairly broad text.